Papa Day, and thank you for your patience and welcome. The Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture is now called to order. Today's Friday, September 3rd, 2021. The time is 2.20 p.m. Notices for these hybrid hearings were disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on Friday, August 27, and Wednesday, September 1, 2021. Notice was also published in the Guam Daily Post on Friday, August 27, and again on Wednesday, September 1, 2021. This is a hybrid hearing, so we have both in-person and those on Zoom. And this is hosted by the legislature's AV staff and my committee staff, so thank you for your assistance. The host will mute all Zoom participants until called upon by the chair. All persons testifying, please state your name for the record and for uh, ease in our transcription of these proceedings. Um, we will begin, this is an oversight hearing, and so we will uh, allow senators uh, to ask questions at the end of the, the chairperson's questioning of the panel. We do have another hearing at 4 p.m., so that's our only time constraint uh, today, as well as the time constraint to get our public health officials out of here as soon as possible. So we would try to be uh, sensitive to that. All right, so we're here today for an oversight hearing of the Department of Public and Health and Social Services. This is the sixth legislative hearing held by this committee to receive updates from the department on their efforts during the public health emergency. In our last hearing in February, we focused on public health's plans to contain the virus through vaccination efforts and meet the goal of achieving 80% vaccination by July. We also discussed the department's COVID response related hiring and staff detailing. Several months have passed and we reached our 80% goal in late July. As everyone is well aware, our island has been experiencing a massive surge in positive cases and our hospital census continues to rise. There have been 1,545 new cases between July 23rd and August 27th. Half of these positives for one were from last week alone. That's from July to August. And this number does not even include the 863 positives in the last six days. To put that in perspective, prior to July 3rd and prior to reaching our 80% vaccination goal and lifting the restrictions, we were only seeing about 40 positive cases per week. I've asked, well, before I get into the substance of this, the hearing, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues, beginning with Senator Joanne Brown. Thank you, Senator, for being here in person. We also have Senator Tello Taitigui and Senator Amanda Shelton, uh, who have joined us on Zoom. Thank you, Senators. And um, we have a great team from the Department of Public Health, and I will allow the director at this time to introduce them, please. And some of them are in person, Thank you, and we had only a capacity of six, so a lot of them are joining us by Zoom as well. Good afternoon, thank you, Madam Speaker, Senator Brown, Senator Shelton, and Senator Tidegui. I'm Arthur San Augustine, the Director of Public Health and Social Services. With me this afternoon is our Chief Public Health Officer. To my immediate left is Chima Imbakwid. And to his immediate left is our Territorial Epidemiologist, Dr. Ann Povitsky. And to her immediate left is Annette Uggen, who is our Administrator for the Bureau of Com Communicable Disease and Control. To my immediate right is Patrick Soto. He's our CDC Emergency Response Coordinator. And we're waiting on one more person, and when she comes, that should be Zenia Pacina, who is not just only the Administrator for the Health Professional Licensing Office, but also our Nursing Resource Command Point person. And so uh, that is the team uh, on Zoom. I saw a few public health employees, but I don't have visual of that, but I'll say that I, it's a Deputy Director, uh, Terry Uggen, we have Chief Environmental Health Officer, Administrator Chief there, uh, Tom Nadeau. Uh, we have Rochelle, she's gonna, Paulino, who is the Acting Administrator for the Division of Public Welfare. And for my finance team, I have Tommy Tidegui and Arlene Pierce. And I have Berta Thyrone, Tyrone, who is with us from the General Administration, which is also with the Director's Office on the lower part of the screen. Thank you very much, Director. And so all of these persons have been sworn in by our Sergeant of Arms prior to going live today. All right. 
So, um, you know, after seeing the, the changing circumstances and the, the executive orders coming out in the last, uh, you know, week or two, uh, I call this oversight hearing because I thought it was clear that although we had done a very, very good job in getting the vaccination rates up yeah. and uh, successful in that, that um, there were still other options, I believe, that were available to the government of Guam that I wanted to see, you know, how we were handling and if we were, in fact, um, maximizing all of our options available to us before separating the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated, um, you know, in activity. And uh, so some of these I had sent to the Department of Public Health as topics for today. Uh, because we know the Department of Public Health's mandate is so large and there's no way we can in one public hearing cover uh, all of it. It will just be focused on these particular items. And, um, and these include, uh, I wanted to know about the treatment, the ability to treat those patients at high risk of hospitalization and to treat them with monoclonal antibody treatment uh, after testing. And I know we're going to hear about that today. And I wanted to know about the school safety and going forward and how we are going to ensure that and what um, more we could do to ensure that. The third topic is the public health mandates and safety guidance relative to vaccinated versus unvaccinated patrons and employees of businesses. and the details. I'm continuing to call on public health for data on COVID-19 infections of vaccinated persons, unvaccinated persons, where these clusters are occurring. Um, I believe that if we can get all the details out to the public, that they are going to be able to help us in this regard by showing the community what types of transmission is occurring that they know so that they can know exactly where these are occurring, how they are occurring, what they can do and what they uh, should avoid very specifically. Also, you know, I want to talk about whether we have done all we can in regards to contact tracing. It seems that their capacity for it, and I know this just from persons who have experienced are, are relaying to me that they're, they're not being contacted immediately with the results in some instances. Uh, so those positive cases are not being told that immediately. And uh, also, I, you know, of course we heard uh, some of this on the radio this morning that we're changing strategies, mm -hmm. but I wanted to know about the strategy of the contact tracing because we had talked about this in prior public hearings, oversight hearings particularly, as to how we were going to increase our capacities to prepare for surges in all of these areas. And so I wanted to follow up today, if we had prepared, if we are prepared, and, or, you know, or what happened, what was the impediment as to why we were not fully up to speed in all of these areas, uh, these other options for us as a government. All right, so I think, uh, we're going to begin now with the first topic. Sure. A welcome to Xenia. Thank you. Xenia Piscina. And so the director had introduced you earlier, and thank you for joining yeah. us. All right. So, first, I, I wanted to know um, what are the Department of Public Health and Social Services, what is your ability to treat COVID 19 positive patients at high risk of hospitalization with monoclonal antibody treatment and other? at public health or other facilities upon testing. So we know that this treatment is supposed to be done at GMH and GRMC, but I wanted to know, have you developed a capacity? Was it a part of your plans to develop a capacity for extending this treatment through public health sure. in other ways? And sure. if you could expand on that right now, please. Uh, Madam Speaker, I will respond to that. Of course, my Colleagues here, I ask you to please chime in should you have additional information or details to share with the speaker and members of the legislature and our listening public. So with the monoclonal antibody, 
um, GMH is actually already administering that, but they administer that to their current patients. And so they're not standing up a very specific effort just for that. It's already been part of their process for treatment. Uh, I believe Dr. Jolene Huggin yesterday evening during the Physician's Advisory Group, the Physician's, uh, sorry, Physicians Advisory Group shared that they treated anywhere between five and seven yesterday. I believe I understood that was seven that they treated yesterday under the MAB. Sorry, our, uh, so, Director. Sure, no problem. I'm not sure if it's just hearing you. It's either you're talking really fast or okay. if you could just slow down just a little bit. All yeah, right, all right. thank okay, you. Okay, Madam Speaker. It's probably members. the echo in here as well. Okay. Uh, Madam Speaker, members of the 36th Guam Legislature and to the listening public and my team at Public Health and Social Services, I'll respond to the MAB, the monoclonal antibody test, uh, treatment, sorry, treatment, and also invite them to chime in should additional information or details be available through them. So I just want to share first and foremost that GMHA has already the capacity for the treatment, and they are treating their patients whom they identify. And so as of yesterday, during our physician's advisory group meeting, uh, Dr. Jolene shared, I believe it was five or seven, or I believe it was seven that they treated. We are also building capacity today through the collaboration of the Guard, Guam Regional Medical Center, and Public Health. We are all working together to stand up today, and it starts at 1 o'clock today for the MAB treatment over at GRMC. Their hours of operation are weekdays from 1 to 5. And so what's happening, as you mentioned, Speaker, Madam Speaker, is that from testing, those that are then referred over for the monoclonal antibody treat, uh, treatment at GRMC. In addition to those two efforts, uh, we're working with our staff who is also reaching out to private clinics who may be interested in also operating and managing a treatment site for MAB. In addition, we have already reached out to HHS, Health and Human Services, and they are gearing up to send us a team of 20 members, they call it an administration team, and their focus would be to provide monoclonal antibody treatment, but through subcutaneous or sub-Q. And that would be two uh, shots on the abdomen, one on the inner thigh and one on the upper arm. And that will take 10 minutes and then an hour of observation. The IV infusion is an hour and the observation is an hour. So we're looking at having various options for the people to go on, but also to have not just GMHA, GRMC, hopefully some private clinics will join the effort. We are also looking at having a public health site for this treatment as an option. And so that's where we're at today with the monoclonal antibody efforts. We are moving forward on this and we are doing a real focused effort to stand this up so that we can help both hospitals de decompress so that we can prevent hospitalization, which this treatment is intended for up to 75 to 80%. And that's what we're doing at this time, Madam Speaker. All right, thank you. I appreciate that update on your efforts. And, and we did hear, of course, Chima on the radio this morning talking about uh, also recruiting from UOG, GCC, in addition yes. to the HHS nurses or yes. uh, persons. So the, are the treatments, do they have to be administered by, uh, who can administer these? Can they be nurses alone or doctors or EMTs or? What, what type of capacity do we need for that? Um, Madam Speaker, for the infusion, it would have to be nurses. But for the sub-Q, sub will be EMTs or any trained medical personnel. All right. And um, so you're partnering now with the, you said the HFS? HHS. HSS and um, current staff of public health, GRMC, GMH, and also the guard? Yes, the guard. The guard has been right. very critical to our operations, as you already okay. know, ma'am, yes. uh, Madam Speaker, not just with this effort, but also with vaccine and testing, vaccine clinics and testing. All right, and so you're going to try to set up an, one uh, location outside of the hospitals to, to offer this. What about the community centers, north and south? Those are not available for this type of treatment? Yeah, we're, we were thinking somewhere that would be separate and apart. Uh, these was a, another location that would be separate and apart from our health centers. Our health centers, uh, especially up north, is really tight on space. And if we were to try to set this up there, it would be quite a challenge for us. All right, and how soon can we expect these? Uh, I'm, yeah, curious. 
yeah, why we are waiting. I actually took a phone call in here from HHS. So we will be meeting with them regularly, and this morning they are, they've actually activated um, one HHS liaison on Guam. So he started this morning, and he's already met with myself and the director. And then we uh, scheduled a Zoom meeting tomorrow morning to discuss further what, how we can set up quickly. So we, we've discussed um, the process improvements in our, right. in our own public health structure, looked at our referral system. We've also identified a few sites that we, that we could use. But the HHS team that is coming is actually a team of 20, but it's five teams, or four teams. These four teams can actually set up four different sites. So we, we have a team that can set up four different sites on the island coming in from HHS. So we are working on identifying hard structures where they can have the treatment. All right, so, is this something then that was reliant on HSS? There, it wasn't something we could have just done on our own? We had to wait for them? No, we, Why we, is that? No, we're actually, like, like the director stated, we are actually supporting the clinics and uh, the hospitals right now to start the treatment. So this morning, we've actually started the first set of treatments with, in collaboration with um, the, the, the gong and um, GRMC. But um, that is, the HHS is supposed to come in to supplement what we're doing, and also we've reached out to the clinics who are interested, because the way it works, the clinics can actually order the medication on their own, so they don't even need public health to order it. They can order, and they can actually administer the treatment. And um, what we're seeing right now is that there's an increased demand for testing in the clinics, and um, this is also an opportunity for them to to have those people who test in their clinics and offer them that same treatment. So they can order, order the medications on their own. All right. Um, can, you, can you expand on who are the patients that will be eligible for this type of treatment? I know they're described in the literature as high risk, and then they describe the risk, you know, what makes you a high risk. But I just wanted to, if you could just announce that for the public, what makes a person eligible for this type of treatment after they yeah. test positive? Right. So there's a, there's a two-pronged approach to the treatment. First of all is trying to keep the unvaccinated out of the hospital because they are the ones who get sicker with the virus. Number two is also identifying people who might be vaccinated with uh, underlying conditions who might also be hospitalized. They're also offering that treatment to them. And then the third one is using the medication as a post-exposure prophylaxis for close contacts to individuals who are positive. So the, 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 the way it is designed is if, if an unvaccinated person with underlying condition tests positive, the, the treatment is offered immediately so that they, they'll, they'll keep them out of the hospital. Second category will, would also target those who are vaccinated who get exposed. But the, the third part of it, which is using it as a post-exposure prophylaxis, is what we're going to look at down the line. The, uh, yeah, Madam Speaker, okay. um, I can also add with that, um, in addition to what the Chief Public Health Officer is sharing, uh, for example, these are some high-risk factors, and they're not limited to this age. Uh, someone who's six, 65 years of age or older, uh, obesity, pregnancy, chronic kidney disease, and these are some examples, but also in the literature that we are using for this monoclonal antibody treatment, it also has reference for, you know, there's anything unique to our race or ethnicity. So those are also factors that could be considered in terms of who would be suitable for this MAV. All right, so are they, do they require a referral by a doctor or are the people at the testing sites going to be able to refer them to these treatment okay. sites? So we, we're actually working out a triage system. So we, we changed our testing protocols this morning to accommodate that. Because one of the, one of the um, criteria is um, unvaccinated high risk. So when we identify people who are unvaccinated and high risk, the gong actually has a doctor on site right now. They, are triage, they, are, they, they get tested with the Binax to check if they are positive on site. If they are positive on site, they are, they are triaged on site and referred for treatment. 
But in the event that they are not positive on site, because they fit the criteria, we run, um, we run another confirmatory test on that same specimen. If they are positive, the individuals at the lab will contact the doctor, and then the doctor would continue um, with the patient. So that way, we, we are using, we are using a two-pronged approach to identify them on site and also follow up if they need a confirmatory test. The, if they are confirmed later, not immediately, not on site, yeah. which doctor is contacted? The, the, one, the one who triaged them on, on site. All right. And that person, that doctor is going to be able to get a hold of these positive cases and call yes. them up? Yes. yes. That's what the doctor is going to do? Yes. Yes, and we have a do the doctor we're working with at this time, and we're looking to build capacity by having a public health physician also added to this effort, is Dr. Lewis Cruz. He's working with us. This is our very first day at this, so we're going to, I'm sure, have a follow-up meeting in terms of how the first day went, how we could improve on the processes. Uh, if the processes work very well, then we just want to continue to reinforce that. All right. I just, we've seen that when we need the nurses and the doctors to be making the phone calls, it really takes a lot of time, a lot of time, and takes them away from a, what they're doing there on site. So, all right, uh, but that's how it is as yes, of today. Okay, and fees, are there fees for this treatment? Uh, for, for public health, there's no fee for the testing, but for the treatment, there's a CMS um, treatment, um, Payment for to the doctors, not from uh, public health. Is actually treatment is covered by CMS. I don't understand. So we, we the patients are not paying for it. Okay. Yes. It covered is. by uh, CMS. CMS. Oh, okay, okay, great. All right. And so even patients who have private insurance, this is covered by CMS. Um, <laughs> or are you saying that's for CMS covered patients? CMS, there's a CMS fee schedule for the treatment. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that means Medicaid is covered, yeah. but um, and those on Medicare, but those on private insurance, we don't know yet, um, or with, whether it will be covered. All right. If you could just clarify that and maybe okay. get that out to the media. All right. I want them to know whether they're entitled, if they need to follow up with their own private doctors to get referrals. So it sounds like they're going to need some kind of doctor's referral to get to these treatment centers. Uh, if, they, if they're positive, if they're unvaccinated, positive, or if they're high risk, uh, positive. Sorry about that. In working with a... Go In working with... Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> In working with the guard and our other team members of public health and everyone really involved, um, what you're saying, Madam Speaker, is exactly the direction we're going into is to message this out so those that are interested, those that are positive, not only will they be aware of the treatment option, but also the cost that's associated and who will pay for that. So that's definitely part of our plan is to message that out. And our comms team is already much aware of that. They're probably working on it right now as we're here discussing the uh, on the oversight man. All right. It's um, I'm sure that when you get it running smoothly, it's going to be fantastic, like all of your programs are. But this period of this, uh, you know, getting it set up is very almost antagonizing for, I think, for me, for the public. We want to know why, what's taking so long. Why not, right? Why wasn't this ready and uh, what was preventing it? So, yeah, that's why I'm asking about the local capacity versus are we going to be utilizing EMTs? Can we bring in, you know, those who are trained EMTs at the fire department and others to help in this to if it's needed? Yeah, uh, Zanya, I think you can share that you're also looking at some other additional stuff. If you could share with the speaker, please. Thank you, Zanya. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, Madam Speaker Good afternoon. and uh, Senator Brown. I apologize for being late, but um, I had to go decontaminate after TGen, right, <laughs> at the testing. But um, I wanted to, to just share that today was the first time that we tried, it a, new, we tried a new system um, because we introduced the monoclonal antibody treatment. And so the process went, um, it was a little hairy in the beginning, but it's pretty smooth but we were able to identify at 1 p.m., we were able to identify at least 26 high-risk wow. individuals that qualified for this treatment. 
So Dr. Lewis was on site and um, he was able to meet with them immediately because when we do the Binex testing, they're there on site, they wait for the test, the 15 minute, it's a rapid test, they get the results and he's out there speaking to them and getting the consent for treatment. And then he refers them straight to GRMC or, or other treatment sites. So it was pretty exciting to see that um, we did, that out of the 26 that were identified as high, high risk, as of one o'clock, uh, they all opted to take the treatment. So it's pretty exciting. All right, and that's for TZN. But we are trying to expand testing sites, right? So you're going to need to do that at the other sites yes. if you expand. And are, that's part of the plan? Okay. Yes, that is part of the plan. Not okay. only our testing sites, but also to coordinate and collaborate with the private uh, providers yes. that also conduct testing. So they, too, have become aware that they're not providing the treatment where they can refer their patients to for right. the treatment. And is the subcutaneous treatment available in Guam now or not yet? Right now, the approach being used is IV. Uh, the subcutaneous treatment is the team that's coming. That's all they'll be able to offer is sub-Q. It's a team of 20, and they're called administration team, and that's the other call that we'll be following up on tomorrow. But we have already submitted the request to HHS. To get the... The team out here to Guam. In, uh, but you need a team to do the subcutaneous? You well, can't do it here without them? No, it's not that we can. We're wanting to build capacity. Um, you know, we just are getting the GDOE nurses, for do example. Do you have the medicine to do it? Can a doctor do it right now if they wanted to? Oh, yeah. we, we'd, have to <laughs> we'd have to ask our doctors at the, at the um, health center, but we're not set up at the health center right now for this. Uh, we, we'd have to talk with them. We haven't had a chance to speak with our own physicians. So Dr. Lewis Cruz has uh, been helping us with this, and that's, he's our lead person right now from the physician site. But we're going to be working with our own physicians to ask them to help us with this. All right. I guess, yeah. So those are, that's, yeah. the, that's the overriding concern that I have in all sure. of this, is that if we were planning for surges and we were trying to think of you know, all the possibilities that we had, you know, were we growing our own local capacity to do this or not? And if it takes doctors and nurses, then, you know, that we train them, plan for it. Yeah. So, Thanks so much. Do, you, do we have the medicines on Guam to do the subcutaneous? Tests. GMH does have the medicines on Guam, but, but they're only at GMH. I understand GRMC is, um, has placed their order. I don't know if they received it already, but they have placed their order as well. For the subcutaneous? Oh, uh, no, for the monoclonal antibody. For the That's, IV. Uh, well, the monoclonal antibody is, yeah. the, is what's used for either the sub-Q or the IV. Okay, so you can, same medicine, you, That's, you, yes, you determine yes, yes, which uh, method. Okay, yes, ma'am, speaker. All right. Um, are private clinics allowed to get that medicine from the hospitals, or how are they going to get it? Well, well, private clinics, I understand, can order directly as well. Okay. And so that's why we're reaching out to them to see if they too would be interested in offering this treatment at their respective clinics. All right. Okay, and um, I wanted to just, uh, I know this is not a hearing on DOE, but I just wanted to, in particular, if we could give, you know, some, um, just some guidance going forward. So we see the increasing infections with children who are unvaccinated, of course, because they weren't eligible to be vaccinated. But um, so as of, and that, you know, we know that the existing mandate when schools let out, that was a three, three foot mandate. August 30th, the JIC uh, tracking of student cases noted that there were 116 school related positives, 63 in elementary, 27 middle school, 26 in high school. And now we're talking about pediatric patients being hospitalized. Um, and our, so I, I guess, uh, will this information be reported? How many pediatric patients are hospitalized on ventilators in the ICU? And is this information being given to GDOE to help them to assess their mitigation going forward uh, with the goal of opening schools safely? And because uh, at one point the superintendent was on the radio saying that he did not have the information as, you know, as to how many children were being hospitalized or things like that. So okay. I just want to make sure we don't have any gap in communication of the data. 
And this is just another one of those, I think the public should be entitled to all the data and that they shouldn't have to wait one month. They should get it on a day by day basis, all the details. And so sometimes, you know, the JICs don't give the same details. And sometimes we hear Chima or someone else on the radio giving some details. Sometimes it's Dr. Ann, but I, I just still can't understand why all the details can't come out to the public every single day, every detail that we know, and, and uh, at least to help them continue to assess and plan going forward. Prior to the shutdown of in-person learning, GDOE was uh, complying with the social, I mean, the mandates of public health at that time. Uh, three foot for in-class settings, other mitigation strategies, and you know, yet we're still concerned with them, right? And, and I had just, um, I wanted to know, we have no data that I can see from Dodea schools as to whether their mitigation strategies are helping them to avoid infections up there. We know from their advertising it earlier on that they had plastics between every student, the cubicles, and they had um, other things. Oh, the HEPA filters in, inside their building. So I just want to know, so what are your plans for the schools? I mean, are we, are you, have you already decided any changes that will be implemented Excuse in me. these schools as to these guidances going forward? Have you seen any success, for example, in Dodea versus outside? Are we, do we know those, those types of, that type of information? Yeah, but I think both and I would like to share a few points. I don't know if uh, Patrick and yeah, Patrick, uh, we did some site visits of the GDOE schools. And so some schools are uh, very much able to put forth the guidelines that we have put um, out, issued out, in, in, into practice. Um, some schools are, are challenged, especially what I refer to as the transitions. And the transitions periods are the arrival of the school students, the class between, um, per between periods, lunchtime, and the period in which the team was going to go out to observe also when the kids were being picked up at the end of the school day. Uh, we did see some schools, I mean, they, they really stepped up and they had students eating in the classroom uh, for a certain grade, another group will come in. Uh, they segregated, they, they distinguished playground and, and said, okay, first and third graders go on this side of the playground, uh, second and fourth graders go on this other side of the playground. So the schools, also had like um, staggered lunch schedules or two lunch schedules. They had some cafeterias that had a student desk. So the schools had different, varying approaches. Uh, what we saw was a, a real hard effort on the staff of the Department of Education to, to come and do the best they can to protect the school age kids. Uh, but we still had concerns about that transition. And um, as you have shared with us, the number of positives that were in the school, and these are kids in the school, but. Uh, I think what's important also is, as of this morning, and it may have changed, and that's why Mr. Patrick is here, we have not had any confirmed school transmission. The positives in this school, and before I go any further, has that changed? To my understanding, or to my knowledge as of today, um, that has not been confirmed. Yeah. You know, as so, they, sorry. what about going forward? So I just want to know, what have we yeah, learned? Sure. What have we learned about the transmission that we can put in place at the schools to make sure that it's not transmitted at schools when we do open again? Okay. Well, like, well Chima's also been part of the effort. I, like I said earlier here, I probably want to respond like to we this. We know um, that the schools have been uh, doing really double work, triple work, trying to keep the students segregated. We yeah. do know also that there have still been places where they're not that able to segregate the kids, yeah. such as transportation and cafeteria, yeah. like uh, those yeah. types of things, just because of the number of students. Right. And so I just want to know, right. we know all those things and you know what you've learned in the past. What do we, what are we thinking of going Moving forward? forward. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, Madam Speaker, going forward is still using the same guidance because the guidance was actually meant to have a safer school system. It was designed to make the school safer. But the caveat there is that we're also going to look at what is going on in the community as we open the schools. And the new guidance has a layered approach to actually keep the schools safe. But what happens is that if there's an increase in the community cases, it also tends to 
tell us what next uh, actions to take, which was what we did in the last few weeks. When we started seeing the increase in the local cases, we had to shut the schools down because what, what happened was that the community, the community increase was actually going to affect the schools. So going forward, the first thing is to look at the cases in the community. So if the cases are low in the community, we continue with the guidance because the guidance stipulates vaccination as the number one approach for teachers who, and workers in the school so as to protect the kids who are, not, who are vaccine in, ineligible. We looked at this, the seating arrangements, which is the, 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 the three feet and the six feet where it's applicable. We also have the cohort system. And the cohort system was actually the next step we were going to get into with the schools before we had these huge numbers. Because what the cohort system does for us is to ensure that we're able to keep the same people together every time so that if there is, an, if there is any um, new transmissions within the school, we're able to identify where that transmission is coming. And because it's a cohort system, those cohorts do not mix with other cohorts. So going forward, we're still going to adopt the same system and then looking at the, looking at the, um, looking at the, uh, um, the, the, um, how am I going to put it? Looking at the, uh, um, um, the information that we got, you know, when we did the school, when we went to the schools with the, with the superintendent, we're going, what we're going to do is actually put up recommendations in place to take care of those um, outlying situations where the mitigation plan would not happen because every school is different and um, we, are, we are looking at a generalized plan, but having targeted interventions for schools that do not meet some of those uh, mitigation measures. So is moving forward is working consistently with the DOE to address those situations where they come up in particular schools. So when you say uh, same guidelines with a cohort system, you mean still looking at three foot mandates versus six foot mandates, still uh, not requiring barriers between the students and uh, the cohort system, you mean that's going to be like smaller populations in the schools or in the classroom? Yes, so what, what, what we're looking at is let, um, in the schools, like in the dining, we can have a cohort of three eating lunch at the same time, not having everybody in at the same time. And what, it, what it's going to do is if there's, if there's a transmission going on, it's only going to affect one cohort. But if it actually moves to another cohort, it will still be in, in, in a bubble where we don't have to shut down the schools, but address those situations as they arise. All right. Um... Did you, are there plans for expanded testing in the schools or were, was school testing expanded with uh, some of the money that you have received at Public Health? Yes, of course okay. you're doing screening testing, go ahead. All right, so we have the screening testing um, as part of the school reopening plan. There's a $5 million grant for the school reopening plan for testing. And we've been working with the schools, you know, on how to expand the, the funds for screening testing in the schools. And 80% of the, 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 the funds is supposed to go to the schools, not to public health. We're supposed to work with them to give them the money to, to do the screening testing and just provide what guidance. What do you mean by work with them? Has it been settled yet, or are you just beginning? We've been, we've been to working find, with, we've To make been, a plan, yes, is there a plan? There's a plan. We've, 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 we're actually of how working, you're going to test at the schools? Yes, we're actually working with DOE and six private schools for the testing screening, a uh, screening testing. So they're gonna get that money or you're gonna, you're gonna use it for testing at the schools? It's just testing, the money is just to test in the schools. Okay. If, if I may, Madam Speaker, to add on to Chima's uh, point, we have been working extensively with DOE uh, as well as some of the Catholic and the private schools. And as a success story, I would like to say uh, is that the Catholic schools have fully implemented their testing program in the sense that when we see these kids testing positive and when they identify their close contacts, they don't have to refer them to the Northern Public Health Clinic or to the Tizen Outreach. They simply send all of their kids, all of these close contacts in a manner that fits with our guidance uh, to a certain Catholic school that operates as its own testing site. So that's kind of one of the, one of the um, 
the ideal uh, end, game, or end goals for this testing program. It's so that we, effect, we effectively alleviate some of the um, burden, I guess. I don't want to say burden, but yes, yeah, some of the burden on public health. Uh, and, and yeah, so we've been working with not just DOE, uh, but a, a good amount of the Catholic schools. And we are seeing an increase in interest, uh, especially given this, this recent mandate. Yes, I heard that. That's very efficient from mm -hmm. people that are using that one for the Catholic school set. Do you have that in place for the public schools? Uh, that's something that we're still working with the public schools on. Um, all right. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, because we're all looking for some hope that the schools are going to open. Parents, that's, they call me all the time. They want to know how long is, are we looking at? And I want to know from public health, how long are we looking at, right? Are, mm -hmm. Is this real or do you, are your plans in place? Are they in being implemented or are we just making plans right now. That's what I want to know. Sure. Okay. And I guess I want to know the data, if you have it from, you know, the Dodea schools. Have the, their different mitigation measures been effective or not versus, you know, ours? And I know that our teachers have been working really hard, but if we need to give them anything more, I know that there's been a lot of money, uh, you know, brought to Guam for those purposes particularly, and I just want to know if public health is directing them uh, so I hear the cohort system and that otherwise they're doing well, but no plans to increase, for example, sinks or, um, or barriers or, or things like that at this point, just to change the number of students at, that are there or in bubbles at one time. Yes, ma'am, ma the, the, uh, the guidance actually allows for barriers too. So what, what the, what the um, guidance says is, in any way the school wants to you know, promote safe distancing in school, we work with them for that. You know, initially, it was a six feet distance with barriers. There's a guidance for students to face the same way. So all those guidances remain is what is applicable to the school at that point. Some schools can, can actually mix those uh, mitigation measures to achieve uh, and protect their students. And I know you announced this morning about um, opening up the vaccination again at UOG. Yes. yes. And will there be any testing at UOG as well? Uh, at this time, no, not testing. Okay. So it's, just it's, vaccination at UOG. Yes, it is a vaccination clinic um, starting tomorrow at the University of Guam. We're resuming that operation. All right. And then the public health centers. Yes, the For public sure health they centers. Have testing. Do they also have vaccinations? The, the public health centers are doing the um, vaccinations north and south, and we're still maintaining the Thursday and Saturday Micronesia Mall vaccine clinics, and we're committed there through the end of September. For vaccination. For vaccination. So, what about testing? Testing right now, we're doing. Um, are we doing it up north? Are so you doing? Just so, in? For for testing, we're actually testing at the Northern um, Community Health Center for the close contacts and people who are traveling for medicals. Right. Then at the TZN, we're testing every day since the 9th of August. But there is also an increase in demand for testing. So we're having clinics ask for more testing platforms. We're, we're actually training, we just trained them, the Catholic school, to have their teacher, to have 14 teachers to be able to test in, in the school. We've T uh, we've trained um, teachers to test in a private school. You said in Catholic school. Catholic schools. Yes. Teachers will be doing testing. It, um, yeah, the teachers and the, because the testing is the binax. We can yes. is uh, the 15 yes. minutes test. Mm -hmm. We've tested private organizations who have indicated interest. You know to to teach their staff how to test. So what is going on is that a lot of community um, organizations are actually coming to public health to get that training and ask for support to be able to train their own members. So we're seeing, we're seeing public health you know, on one side testing, we're, we're getting the support of the clinics, but at the same time, like the GIAA will be trained soon to be able to do that. Custom does it on its own. The judiciary is doing the same. The police, the DOC, the, 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 uh, DOC, the fire department, all, this, all these organizations have their own testing platforms they test their people, and then when they are positive, they refer them to public health. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So that continues that people can still apply for that type of a program and be trained by public health. Yes, and, and then... All the, right. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, yes. great. Um, the next topic was this. Uh, the guidance re relative to vaccinated versus unvaccinated patrons and employees of businesses. Um, 
So when we first um, heard, you know, some of the changes, we sent a letter to on August 5th to Public Health asking for more data and information regarding, at that time, 101 positive cases because we had seen a slight increase in cases from July 23rd to August 5th. So at that time, I, in August 5th, I asked for a breakdown of the positive cases that were vaccinated versus unvaccinated. That was not reported. And, and I think uh, this continues to not be reported up to today. Um, but unfortunately, to that request, I received a report today yes. from the department one month later and it says that on the 172 positive cases from July 23rd to August 6th, uh, close to 2,000, we've had 2,000 more positive cases since then. But um, in that report, 42% of the 172 positives were among the fully vaccinated individuals. So we knew since August 5th, or public health knew since August 5th that 42% of the individuals testing positive were already vaccinated, 55% um, unvaccinated. There was also information in the report regarding contact tracing and it noted that there were nine case investigators, three contact tracers during that time period. And the maximum number of days between investigation to contact tracing was two days. And so that, that's helpful information, but yeah, I, w I think this information is much more valuable. It, it's real time, right? This is a month later, we're looking back now, and, but uh, I really, I, I am asking again, I have asked, I think at every single public hearing to get this type of data from public health on an, a real time basis. So- Madam Speaker. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, we have Dr. Ann Flavitsky this afternoon, and, and we, um, th this is coincidental because um, she and I have been talking with our team, and so she did a presentation this morning, and the idea is that she would be doing these periodic presentations, and we're even looking at the possibility of a pre-recorded presentation that we would air out, and she would be providing, I'm not sure if it's going to be weekly, I'm hoping weekly, but, you know, speaking with her, she's like, Art, right, you're not going to see... You know, director, you're not going to see these significant uh, changes in numbers like every day, every week. But um, she does have a presentation, and I would ask if you would consider if she could share that with the uh, community this afternoon. All right. Well, can you tell us first what is your decision on whether that information will be released regularly then? I, I, well, we would like to, uh, Dr. Ran and I are, are negotiating the uh, frequency. But uh, as she gets it out, we're looking at maybe, Dr. Ann, are we looking at every other week? So oh, we're, we're yeah. going to shoot for once a week. You know, this is data that her and her team pulls together, and I. Uh, All right. So what my, is that? my interest in it is, uh, I think, as policymakers, we're interested in what data is being provided, of course, to the physicians who are advising the governor. Okay. What data is public health directly providing to the governor when the governor makes this her right. executive orders and, and these mandates, and how you know how they tie together? Sure. And so. Uh, I'm sure we were all in the same room, we would have all these explanations, but we're not. And so you know that this has been going on for a year now, and we need, I think, if you want to bring the public along, mm -hmm. you bring them along every single day, you give them the data every day that you are presenting to other people. This is public data. You give them what the physicians are going to know, and you give them what uh, the, you know, any other sector of the government is mm -hmm. going to know so that the public as well can hear it and do sure. what they want with it. You know, yeah. if you think it's not so, relevant to them, I don't see why not. If, it's, if you're doing it on a daily basis, then share it on a daily basis, yeah. if you're only doing yeah. it. Dr. Uh, as our Territorial Epi, uh, we are working towards having a weekly Territorial Epi report out that she would take the data and she has um, graphs and charts that she would walk the community through. And you know, I was sharing with her that, hey, we could just, you know, instead of doing like a Facebook press con, we could pre-record it and you could use the slides, PowerPoint, so that she can walk the community through it. And, yeah. and also because of the media wants to take data. It's going to be data that is from the Territorial yes. Epi, and it's accurate. If people want to replay it and call us up and say, hey, your data is saying this. Uh, what are you doing? I'm all for that, Art. My question yes, is, Director, mm -hmm. we've asked for this before, mm -hmm. and you did promise before to do it on a weekly basis. And we were getting it on Fridays, I believe, and it, yeah. it was excellent information. And then it 
kind of if, if faded all, away. And yeah. so that's the, that's the issue. I'm sure the presentation is going to be full of great data, but I want to know what is the We're impediment to doing that regularly? Yeah, Why did yeah. it stop? Why does it stop? It never stopped. The daily data is produced every day and it's also released on the JIC. Mm -hmm. Then we update the SIT rep weekly. These other reports have been special reports as needed, like the report today, which is specific to a certain time period that is all of 2021 and then the last two months as we're looking at the surge. So if you'd like to see it, it's got some really compelling data. We, we have enough to do with the daily reporting that, you know, it's, it's only under these kinds of circumstances when we have the surge that we are running these special analyses. And we're going to be doing more. All right, great. Would you like to see it? Uh, I, I will. And yes, definitely. And the, um, so we did, when, because we asked your office, start to receive an email some of these reports. But I yeah. guess, I guess I just want to know sure. why we can't show these to the public on yeah. a reg or why yeah. public health can't show Yeah, we'll it start getting that. I understand I'm going to, they're not always run perhaps, but, but for example, the JICs. We had, a, I heard this asked to you on the radio. This is one of our number one questions. When they start reporting, why are they not reporting vaccinated versus unvaccinated on the, on the positives, right? Uh, they are reporting it on the hospitalizations, but not on the other. And just that type of consistent information. So sometimes you say it on the radio and you have it available to you, but it, it's not on the It's not case. out there, okay. Yeah. So, so ma'am, to answer to that is, uh, you know, the, the daily cases, when we get those cases, you, the, the information you get from is the one the individual puts on the form. But for the data, for the surveillance team, they have to cross-check with the case investigators to dig up more information. Some people do not have their vaccine information at the point of testing. So normally we go to the WebIZ to dig up those numbers. So if we have 10 cases this morning and I report the vaccine numbers, it could change tomorrow because maybe someone who didn't put their vaccine numbers on paper would change. But with what Dr. Ann is describing, on Fridays, we're able to clean up the data and have the, the right information so that when we present that information, it is accurate but not based on what we have at that point. So we, we, we worked on the data that she's going to present now. And another thing is, if you're looking at the daily data, it, it really doesn't show you much. But what she's going to present is going to compare what is going on now with what was happening before. All right. Yes, that's why I'm asking if that type of data can be released more regularly. Because it's exactly like, for example, 300 cases uh, in the six weekly situation reports, 300 cases from what reports say are workplace contacts. But that's all we know. We, we were not able to get from those reports, um, whether those are restaurants versus bars versus government offices versus private offices or some other type of activity, sports. And then we get um, GHRA and other people coming out and saying they know that those were from bars. So they're getting access to this information, but not all of the public's getting access to the information. So they are, there's been representations out there that, you know, a lot of, the spread is happening in certain places and not others, but that's not what these uh, JIC reports are showing to yeah. to everyone who's trying to look at the data. Yeah. You, so, you know, uh, Madam Speaker, unless um, someone else has a different um, narrative, I just want to say for the record that we don't send, I don't send information to GRHA. Um, what information they do say they have, uh, it may be through other sources or perhaps just them knowing their industry, mm -hmm. that they would share that, hey, there's a positive at this gathering or this, but unless but somebody just, else does, you know, they may, but I, for me, I, I don't send it out. I don't think Dr. Hansen. But, but would you say it's fair that um, there is more information available that uh, you are discussing uh, in other capacities that is not being provided to the public on a weekly basis? Yeah. Well, there, with the, I can share with you like what we do and it's, it's really a lot of it, like even the report I presented has information about what the JIC already presents, but I do present that, and I talk about how many people have been fully inoculated, the percentage of those 12 and um, older who are eligible, 18 and older eligible, herd immunity or herd protection, and so I do do those numbers, and, and that's something that I can definitely share with the general community. I'm not, I can include that with Dr. Ann's presentation, but right. you know, it's really um, just where we are with vaccines and our inventory of vaccines and information that that helps us plan out 
uh, not just myself, but our partners. Okay. For example, so we're going to hear Dr. Ann's report yeah. today, yeah. but executive orders have already been in place, right? right? Based on supposedly this data. And so that's that's the disconnect. Yeah, Do you go. understand? Yeah, we get if the data. We, if the then... public is brought along with the data on a weekly mm -hmm. basis at the very minimum, uh -huh. then they can understand changes the in policy steps. based yeah, on okay. that, right? And okay. here, mm -hmm. a month later, it's uh, mm -hmm. we're going to say, okay, that's great to know, but it didn't mm -hmm. help us. It didn't help anybody change their behavior back then. It didn't help right. them to be informed mm -hmm. and say, you know, this is the type of activity that we're right. seeing is uh, creating spread or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. so right. Dr. Ann, we will get to that. Let me just finish these questions and we will, and so we can allow you that time. Um, so that was going to be my question. I'm going to mm. hope they're going to be answered in Dr. Ann's presentation is the clusters, right? Whether they come from businesses, we, we're told social gatherings, that's the only category we get. So we want to know, we're, you know, I'm hearing now weddings, different things, and though I just, you know, again, if the public hears this is the type of activity, then they might be better, you know, they might act differently. And we're trying to affect their actions, yes. right, with information. So that's why I am, again, and I've done this, I think, at every oversight hearing, almost begged you to release the information as you get it. We want to know what type of businesses. We want to know if it's customer contact or something else, right? And were they wearing masks? Because that would help us if you know that, if you're able to investigate those types of things, whatever your investigations show that are informing you as to what you want to shut down or not, I would like to see those types of data. Different establishments, what's the difference between them as far as your data goes? Um, All right, and this is also because GHRA, for example, they had brought up other recommendations, right? Closing, uh, or sorry, limiting capacity in their restaurants. And so they're trying to do that now. Mm -hmm. Women's Chamber, Guam Chamber, they're making their own recommendations to their businesses about, you know, uh, closing capacity. And uh, just, yeah. I, whatever it is that I think should affect policy or what you think the data they're using to make uh -huh. those types of decisions, yeah, I would like that to be available. The justifications. Um, so the data that we have now, I guess after we see this, we're gonna, yeah, wonder, does that, does that you know, lead us to want to revise any of the policies that you have in place at this time, right? Especially, um, this, this dichotomy, I guess, between vaccinated and unvaccinated participants at restaurants and bars. And uh, just because GHRA had brought it up about the bars, or, or Dr. Wen, I think, on the radio also talked about bars. I mean, they're talking about bars are a problem, but I've never heard that really from public health in any of their reports. Right, the yes, formal reports. Yes, I think you said it on the radio again, and that, uh, but not formally, right? Not in a, a written report or something like that. Okay. So, in regards to workplaces and testing, we are getting calls from different workplaces that are saying they were not notified by their. Um, well, physicians are not allowed to notify workplaces only the patient that they're dealing with, whether they're positive or not. So they're relying on the individual to report to the businesses or to their contacts, right? And so we're, that's a big part of our system right now is we're relying on people to mm -hmm. tell their close contacts. Right. And I think they're hesitant to do this in the workplace sometime because uh, you know, they're afraid, afraid to be responsible for uh, implications to the businesses. I'm not sure the, the motivation, but businesses are calling us to say, how can they, you know, get this information? They, they want to know, they want to be able to notify the other Which employees. Really? Have you juggled that? I mean, or, um, no. you know, is there, is there going to be any ch changes in policy as to that? Or are you still just going to rely on the individuals to tell people who they might have been in contact with? Well, well th that's the one approach. The other approach is through the case investigation contact tracing method. Um, do you have any other thoughts on that? 
So, so typically in the case investigation, test, test. Yeah. Pardon? You're on. Oh, okay. So, so whenever the case investigator speaks to someone who tested positive, uh, they like to go back. First, they identify when the symptomatic onset date was, or if they're asymptomatic, because uh, that's kind of what dictates their infectious period. So that, that's what dictates how far back and who we need to contact. Uh, so whenever we come across a place where they work, an establishment that they've been to, um, we will note that down. Uh, but especially with the workplace, because people tend to work closely with each other, they tend to let their guard down, unfortunately. Um, we'll encourage them to inform their employer, their HR department, their boss or manager. And then we let them know that we're going to speak to them, but we're never going to inform them who, who the individual is, right? We're not going to reveal their identity to them. But the fact that, let's say I told the director I tested positive, and the case investigator called the director, it makes it easier because he knows that I, I tested positive. He knows who I've been with, all while protecting the confidentiality and the privacy of that individual. Uh, so from there, we work with the, the manager, the HR department, to procure a list of close contacts who were, who were um, in, in exposed to the individual who tested positive. And we bring that list back to the, the positive index case, and we just work it out to narrow it down, uh, essentially to find out who is the most direct, who is the highest risk, who are the ones that we should focus on. Um, for, for restaurants, for establishments where someone had patronized, um, it's a little bit more difficult, um, especially because individuals tend to forget or tend to not disclose what time or what day uh, they went or even where they sat. Uh, so if we, if for example, I say I went to King's yesterday, I went to King's yesterday, um, I might not tell you as a case investigator where exactly I sat, right? You had this, the, you had the section on the left side of uh, the former smoker section. So when we, when we go across, when we come across these situations, we'll again let the individual know that we're going to inform the establishment, uh, but then we're not going to necessarily narrow it down so that the establishment can uh, hone in or identify who that person is. And that's where these contact tracing sign-in sheets really works. Yeah, so uh, for are, us. are you requiring the employers, uh, you're trying to notify employers, mm -hmm. and you're, are you requiring them to notify the employees? We don't require them. At the end of the day, we'll still do it because we're the public health authority, but we just inform them that this is what we're going to do. This is what's going to happen. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's, mm -hmm. they're not required. They're, they're usually on, majority of the time they are cooperative and they use, Okay. Majority of the time, they come out and reach out to us, say, what do we do? All and right. then we'll go ahead and explain it to them. Thank you. So I realize that, yeah, we're running short of time here. I'm going to go to the last point, and that is the, um, it's the details, again, on this data of the vaccinated and the unvaccinated individuals, the clusters. And so the bottom line, I'm going to skip through all this and get, you know, we, it uh, is that currently, as of, uh, September 2, 6 p.m., out of the 55 hospitalized, 58% uh, were unvaccinated. And um, so the number of unvaccinated and vaccinated is, is really um, had changed dramatically from, since the beginning, and now they're so much closer in percentages. And uh, I guess that. I just wanted to ask if um, this, you know, I know you continue on the radio today to talk about get, you know, we want everyone to get vaccinated and I understand, you know, the rationale, the decrease in severity of the cases, but um, I guess, I guess you're going, are you, do you have hospital data in your data as well? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to leave that until we get to your data. Uh, yeah, it was mostly questions about this surveillance data, what we didn't know, but what we were not able to find out in those. Okay, great. Um, all right, so let's uh, allow Dr. Ann to give her presentation at this point. And then we'll allow my colleagues to ask some questions as well. They just have to load it up on the screen. Yes, they will. So if we could get the PowerPoint.
audio, can you load the PowerPoint from Dr. Ann? There it is. There you go. Sorry, Dr. Ann, I can't hear you. Now I'm on. Okay. Um, the data I'm presenting is a little different. I did it especially uh, so we can take a look at all of 2021 and then take a look at July, August. And that's what you're going to see in the graphs. It's going to switch from all of 21 to July, August to look at what's been going on since we started vaccinating, basically. If you want the daily summary, it's on our dashboard. Uh, the dashboard is being improved, but we still have the daily summary up there. And that gives uh, the summary for the beginning of the pandemic to the present time, the last two weeks in trends, and a daily summary. Um, you're not going to get details about restaurants and any of that, because by the time we have that information, it's already, it's already the, the event has passed. Please scroll down. This first graph is for all of 2021. As you can see, there's, the, there's our surge there in August. We looked really good in March and April. We did see cases January, February. We looked really good March, April, May. We st started to see an uptick. Remains kind of stable, and then boom, there's a surge in August. That, and now the orange line is the seven-day rolling average of cases. Next slide, or next page. This is just July and August, where you can clearly see the surge beginning in early August. We did, I'll show you another slide later that shows we did start to see some concerning trends prior to that. Next slide. This is probably um, the most interesting slide here. This is the hospitalization data. It's kind of hard to see, but this is just hospital cases. If you look at early January 2021 and February up through March, you can see we didn't have a lot of cases in the hospital, but most of them were in the ICU. You can see that. There's a lot of ICU cases. And then it kind of dips in March and April, and then we, they started to see an uptick in May, and then we see our surge. But what's interesting about the far right on that graph is there's a huge number of cases in the hospital, but the number on the, in the ICU is approximately, a slightly higher than in January, February. That's showing you, likely, this herd protection. That there's a lot of people in the hospital, but they're not on the ICUs. They're not having severe illness. They're going to the hospital because they're scared and they're sick. Next slide. Oh, wait, before you go, go back, sorry. Um, the deaths in 2021, there have only been 27 deaths, and there's two now in September. That's not on the graph. That's very low. It's a significant decrease from last year. I think if we hadn't been vaccinated, we'd probably be over 200 deaths. Next slide. This is the same thing just for July and August, and you can see, again, Huge numbers hospitalized, not as many as the ICU. And in July and August, we only had seven deaths. We've had two in the last two days. All but one of the 27 deaths were unvaccinated people. These are preventable deaths, except for possibly the ones in early January, February. The only person who died for, who was vaxxed had several severe comorbidities and was an elderly woman. So, the vaccines are protecting against severe hospital issues, and they're protecting against death. The vaccines are working. Next slide. I'm going to kind of jump these next two slides just so the numbers, proportion of cases that are symptomatic or not. That's for the whole year. There's no real discernible pattern. It's a mishmash. Next slide. Same thing with this. There's no really discernible pattern. It's a, it's a good mix of symptomatic and asymptomatic. It's not like we're seeing a clear trend in breakthrough cases or anything like that. Next slide. Oh, this is comparing um, the Department of Defense cases and our civilian cases. And this is what we started to see approximately eight 
to 10, was it eight weeks ago? We started to see an uptick in the military cases before we started seeing a big uptick in the civilian cases. And the military cases have remained steady and then the civilian population, the surge has just exploded. We just wanted to take a look at that. We might take a look at that further um, later on by village. Next slide. Again, the blue is the DOD. And you can see, actually, you can see the uptick we saw. I can barely see. It started in July. We started seeing that those military numbers increasing before we saw the civilian numbers increasing. And that's what we were watching. We were concerned about that. We were watching it, and then boom, it just all took off. And there's our surge. Next slide. This is by age. You can hardly see it. I'm just showing that the, cases, the case rate was low among all ages until the surge. Next slide will show you the details. As you can see, the gray line is the group that's driving most of the cases and infections. It's the 18 to 39 group. That group. Um, is one of the lowest in terms of vaccination. I guess they think they're immune. The 18 to 30, young, healthy adults, they think they don't need a vaccine. We also saw an uptick, again, as you see the, the kids, uh, 12 to 17, that's the orange line that we've seen a recent uptick, as well as those zero to 11, that's the blue line. And then the 40 to, I can't see it, 40 to 59. The elderly, even though there's been an uptick, it's been low. That's likely also a protective, uh, herd protective factor. 90% uh, of those age 64 to seven, 60 to 74 are vaccinated. About 71% of those over 75 are vaccinated. We need those numbers. That's not safe enough. We need to get 90 or to 95% of middle-aged and elderly people to be vaccinated. And of course, the kids under 12 are now eligible. The lowest group is the teenagers. They could also be vaccinated. Next slide. This is basically showing um, our testing and the positivity rate for the testing. And just shows you how much testing we're doing during this surge. That's for the whole year. Next slide. And you have copies of this, uh, it's a PDF, and there's our July-August testing and the positivity rate. Next slide. This is the proportion of breakthrough cases, or these are numbers or proportion, I can't see. Breakthrough case numbers are in blue, and the unvaccinated is in red. So we're seeing a surge. Yes, unvaccinated people are also part of the surge. Next slide, we'll give you July and August. And it almost mirrors each other, right? But the important thing to note about this slide, the last data we had was from the end of August. The unvaccinated rate is six times higher than the vaccinated. Even though there's an uptick, we're seeing breakthrough cases. All of these vaccines were designed for the Wuhan strain, not Delta, not Wu, not Lambda. So we are seeing breakthrough cases. We are seeing them at the hospital, but they're not in the ICU. So we're not seeing the severe illness and death that we saw last year. The, this last six months, we've really seen the protective factor of vaccines. And there are some people who are talking, uh, epidemiologists, uh, I forget her name, she's at Columbia University. She doesn't talk about herd immunity anymore. She says, we gotta talk about herd protection keeping people out of the hospital, maybe getting treatment, urgent care, hospital, making sure people don't die. That's, that's what we need to do. And that requires getting the vaccinations up. The vaccines still work, it's a protective factor. That's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Ann. And I will provide this to the senators and to the public as well. I appreciate it. Uh, I would just like to conclude by, uh, before I open it up for the, my, the senators uh, that, for example, there was a time we could get information as to restaurant specific or workplace specific. We were getting school specific uh, data, but not these other types of data or information. And I, for me, 
that type of data translates into people when we're not able to contact them fast enough to let them know they might have been you know, exposed, they act on their own and they are able to use that information to act on their own to know, uh oh, I might be exposed, I better not go you know, visit any relatives or get near the baby or get near, you know, they will do that. And uh, that's the reason I want this information available to them faster, um, the more actionable, you know, so that they can make it actionable. And, and some of the data Dr. Ann provided, you know, uh, if we had known it at the time, would we have acted differently, right? That's the question. For example, I know KUM had talked about the difference in the numbers between the military and, and, and uh, civilian population in the very beginning of the uh, surge and whether there should, you know, was any action that could have or did come out of that. Can I answer that? Yes, when we please, please. Yes, we, when we started seeing that uptick in the military cases, we have a weekly Department of Defense meeting with, which Patrick chairs. And it was the day after that meeting, that was on a Wednesday, it was that Thursday that the, the brass, uh, military brass, decided to um, require masks mm -hmm. uh, for the military. Yes, so we, we were on top of that. And then it was after that, a couple weeks after that, they then decided they're going to vaccinate the military starting in September because we know that's a young population. They think they're immune. They're walking around without masks, et cetera. So, yes. Yes, thank you. An additional information regarding those who are hospitalized. Sometimes we talk about they had comor comorbidities. Sometimes when they die, we talk about that, but sometimes we're not talking about that anymore when they're hospitalized. Or for example, what factors diabetes plays in particular, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought we had learned from the past that that is helpful too, because you find out that you're super high risk versus just high risk, right? Mm -hmm. And that you're going to act differently. So again, we want actionable information, right? Information that would, would change behavior. And um, so I'm not gonna, I know I've asked you this in the past and uh, just the vaccinated versus unvaccinated, if you could include that on your JIC reports, just, just to show people, if we're trying to show them that even the vaccinated are at risk of spreading this disease, then let's just show that data, all right, as much as possible. Again, we want to affect behavior. So I'm gonna now allow Senator Brown, thank you for your patience. Don't worry, Mr. S Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm just a little tired this afternoon doing Google Classroom is draining. <laughs> I have to tell you, I've... <laughs> Uh, but thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's very eye-opening, the data that you provided. Um, and thank you to all that you do. I mean, this is a lot of work. I mean, I don't know if there's ever a time that you've been with public health. And Art, I know you've been there close to th over 30 plus years. Uh, the only difference now is we have to use reading glasses to read these days. But, um, you know, the magnitude of the work that you're all involved in and, and getting the awareness out in our community, doing the testing, getting the vaccinations out there, and then obviously collecting all this data so we can put it together and make some sense of it. Um, I think the good news, at least for those that have been vaccinated, at least it's good to hear that we're seeing a reduction in the amount of the degree of the illness and fatalities. I think that's a very, very good information, even though we're seeing more people affected by it and then also now we see and hear more about our children uh, children that are testing positive i just want to get some feedback with regards to that is why do you think that's happening now with regards to children because early on last year the information that was provided it's like well children are not as affected by it and now this round i don't know if this is a delta strain or what the case may be that we're seeing children younger children affected by it and then your data also showed that the teenagers the young adults, uh, you're right, maybe they, we used to think we were you know, immune from everything back in the day. Um, but to know that that's, that age group is certainly some, an age group we need to focus on. But just want to get your feedback, the difference now between last year, particularly with our children. Okay. And um, Madam um, Senator, there's um, one other information that um, <clears throat> is good to share. Because last year at this time, we had a huge cluster of cases in the barracks. And those barrack cases were what drove our numbers very high. But at this point, we're not having any of those barrack clusters because most of them are vaccinated and they are, going, they are actually using the preventive measures that are being uh, prescribed by public health. But as, as at this point, we're seeing a lot of community spread. And we can only point out that it is the Delta variant because it is so aggressive. 
it has actually changed our process. The older variant used to take at least five to seven days for it to be detected by the, the PCR test. The Delta variant is three to four days, but the transmissibility is so high that even within the family unit, and this is what we're seeing with our data, is that families are getting so hard hit because you, you test an individual from a home and you tell them, please go get tested. When they go out to Tizan to go get tested, you're seeing six, seven of them turning positive. And at the beginning, and, and, and when we started noticing the cases um, uh, middle of June or July, I spoke with the team and we agreed to increase our testing capacity. We were testing once a week and we were testing at least 300 cases on Tuesdays with the support from the hospitals. But when we started noticing those numbers, we met with the director and we agreed and he approved for us to improve our um, testing strategy. And what happened was that we started testing from 500 to 800 daily. At some point, we capped at 700 cases a day. And the, the surveillance team started noticing the increase in number of families. But in the reports, you see an individual family with six positives. But these positives are school age kids. These positives are workers in, in establishments. But what we're, we, what we're not seeing was a huge number of increase in the number of cases in the establishments. But in the, in the household, it was increasing. And remember, Guam, Guam never stopped the mask mandate. So that was why when, when people go out in public, they're wearing the mask. So it actually helped us in limiting transmission in, in the public places in some circumstances. But at home, the fire was actually raging. So when we started noticing all this, we now started, when we, when we speak to the family members, uh, Ms. Zina here is actually one of the nurses that reach out to the positive cases. We tell them, please go get your family members tested. I, I had a meeting with the director and we agreed that we, we, we take um, um, resources into the lab because what we're doing in the lab now is that normally they, they get the results, they transmit directly to the nurses. But right now in the lab, if you, are, if you test at Tizen, you're, you are symptomatic, but you don't test positive on the Binax. The result is taken to the lab and run on the gene expert, which, is, which gives you the test result in 45 minutes. And the reason being that as we're seeing that uptick in cases, we're using the PCR to actually target the infections, but we're also looking at people who had symptoms so that we can target them. So now you're seeing this increase in, in, in numbers because we're testing more, we're reaching out to families quicker than we're reaching out to them. So it is a balance. But what has happened is that the, the, the Delta variant has changed the game. It's a new game changer, but what we've been able to do is increase our strategies to try and make sure that we test as much people as we can, isolate them. With this new treatment strategy that we have now, we've actually ha we, we actually have the vaccines on one side and also this treatment option. So what we're going to see is that in the next few weeks, with all these strategies being in place, we're going to see the cases start dipping. So that's what is going on right now. I do have a lot of other questions, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the information you've all provided. I think this gives us a lot to absorb, to be aware of, but I, I do know we have another, a couple other colleagues on the line, and I know we have a four o'clock hearing, so I will suspend any further questions. But again, thank you very much for the work that you do and to continue to communicate with us in the public. It's a very scary circumstance for all of us, and certainly the more information we have for people to make decisions, those that are unvaccinated or choosing not to get vaccinated uh, information is still very valuable uh, to get out there to our community. So thank you. I appreciate all your efforts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you. you very much, Senator Brown. Senator Taitugui. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to Public Health for all your hard work. Um, really appreciate uh, the, the information you provided today. Um, and now that you're saying that most of this information can be done on your, on your website, uh, we can find some of this. I hope it's updated regularly. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I do have a question with regards uh, 
Mr. Director, with regards to the re, uh, Regeneron treatment, um, was public health uh, in, well, collaborating with the private clinics on early on if they wanted to participate in administering this uh, immune therapy? Uh, yes, um, Tess. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, public health is engaged. Uh, we have a person on our staff, Fernando Estevez, and he's helping us and he's reaching out to the private clinics. He's also been very instrumental in the setting up of this, this treatment, the concept of both. Uh, right now it's um, IV infusion, but uh, we're working also for sub-Q. And so he has been instrumental. And as of this morning, he's sharing with me that he's getting some positive feedback from some potential clinics that may be interested in in uh, offering this treatment. Okay, how soon did you get them involved? Uh, we are just rolling this out. So uh, Fernando just gave me that information this morning uh, for the private clinics. So you're just doing this now? Uh, with the private okay. clinics, yes. We had a physician's advisory group last night, Senator, and I think yeah. Fernando took the opportunity to reach out to them and uh, perhaps has done even more than that because that was a a report, uh, an update he gave me this morning during a brief that he said that, you know, he's getting some positive feedback. I don't have numbers or clinics yet. Uh, we haven't had a chance to meet, uh, to reconnect with regards to those details. But I'm sure that, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, one that's really working hard and fast on this. So I'm sure he's going to get some real uh, traction on this. Okay. Um, a lot of the questions were answered, and I know we're, we're up against time here, so I greatly appreciate uh, everyone there. Again, uh, all the hard work that you're doing. Um, I want to take this opportunity right now to uh, wish Chuma a happy birthday as well. <laughs> I know. Are you happy on your birthday, Chuma? Thank you <laughs> and, uh, so much. Okay, happy birthday to you. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, Senator Taitikwi, and uh, to the other senators that were on with us uh, up until the questioning part, Senator Schultz and Senator Bloss, thank you very much. And again, uh, happy birthday, Chima. Thank you for being here. And thank all of you. I know we couldn't get to every topic that we would have liked to. There's always so much information because you're, you're a huge department doing a huge amount of work, and I very much am grateful for you. I want to just do these hearings to make sure. sure that between you, us, and the public, we are all on the same page so that we can help you move these things along faster. And um, again, you've done a great job with the vaccination, rolling those out. Uh, they ended up you know, running so smoothly and every, uh, same with the other programs earlier. And so we're looking forward to success with this, um, the treatments that we're going to be able to offer those who are positive or those who are very high risk. And so um, I want to get those to them as soon as possible. Uh, let us know if you need our assistance in, in changing agency, uh, you know, capacity so that you can, I don't know, whatever resources you need, uh, if we could help. I'm sure the governor is offering everything. This is, uh, she's also very excited to get this out. So yes, yes. we want to see it made available. If there is any other treatment that you are considering, I'm hoping you're working on the plan already and getting it here as soon as possible and that we can do it as much as possible ourselves so that we don't have to wait for others to bring it to us. The data, I'm going to just put in one more plug for this data so sure. that we can get it soon as possible, people can act on it. People can change their behavior based on what you can provide to them. Um, especially when, you know, I know you're doing your best with contact tracing, but it seems to me that despite all our previous oversight hearings regarding the capacity to trace quick enough, if we have a surge, this is a huge surge, a huge surge. and that uh, our capacity is limited. And so we need to find other ways. And so, uh, get the data out and it, it will help. I think um, let us know your plans as we've always asked you how you're going to grow your capacity it's supposed to be grown permanently, right? Because we knew already going forward, you need a bigger capacity to do contact tracing to prevent surges, not just of this, but other communicable diseases. Or, and uh, you had told us that that was part of the plan and that was the purpose of trying to hire additional personnel. But, um, Yes, so I, I want to see that, that those efforts are actually paying off and that you know, we're not just going to be continue to get into this uh, situation over and over. I want to show the community that these um, you know, efforts and your efforts are very fruitful and that they're giving us information that we are using to, to change policy.
right? If we're going to change policy on the government side, it has to be informed, all right? And that's, that's really the bottom line. It has to be informed. And if, it's, if we're guessing or we don't know, I say, say that straight out. You know what I mean? That maybe we are going to try three different things. We're not sure which one's going to work, but say it that way. I'm, I'm open to that as rather than we're going to do this because we are sure it's going to work when the data shows otherwise, right? Or the data doesn't show that at all. Okay. Anyways, I think you get my point. And I want to thank again the senators for being here today and thank all of you. And um, wishing you well and to keep safe. And um, thank you again for all of us uh, to helping us to keep us safe. And I know it's been very difficult. But I thank you again also for keeping the media informed. I think the more you do that, I heard you on the radio this morning, Director. I heard you, Chima, almost every day. I used to hear the two of you uh, very often. Xenia, of course, I've heard you on the radio too. So thank you. I just think that helps, right? And give them the facts. Just yes. give them the facts. They yes. will deal with it. Don't, don't hide it from sure. them. All right. That will conclude our oversight hearing. It is about 10 to 4, so 3.50 p.m. And uh, to again to the, the entire Department of Public Health and Social Services. Take care. Be safe.